maybe where we've uh, we've been running this monthly update. So what it is is I whiz through these slides. Fifty years later, um, the puts it to move the countdown to Apollo Eleven. So but what I've been doing is is doing an update of what was happening in the program fifty years ago each month. So obviously this month is June sixty nine. And next month will be the big month. Um, so these focus, me, uh, these uh, episodes have been basically around the missions, but also in between we've had focus uh, presentations on different aspects of the program. By the way, if you guys want to eat, have dinner, you can go ahead order up there. They'll come up and take your orders and stuff like that. Uh, they'll bring them up. Just give you a number, bring it up. Um, so tonight. Uh, Okay, so what we have to do is transport ourselves in time. This is a very traumatic process. We do it every month. So this is our 29 p.m. And this is 1969. Got his pencil, no computer, lots Space of paper. Pen. Space pen. Yes, it, it's, it works in zero gravity. That, I'll give you that. That's it. So look, I'm not going to... I've got to have to zip through these pretty quickly. I would like to try and do a little bit of a... Um, a scenario of what's going on in 69. So this is um, this gentleman, Antonio Sakaris, uh, 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 from Cuba, basically stowed on board this DC-8 in the car in the landing gear, um, and uh, he made it over the Atlantic Ocean. So, uh, yeah, although I, I think he had, had a colleague with him, and um, he believe we believe he fell out. So, 69. Um, this is interesting. The first authenticated uh, case of falling debris, calling damage on Earth, Japanese freighter ship. Uh, and the Tupolev TU 144 uh, made its first um, civilian airliner to be test flown faster than the speed of sound. And uh, following a meeting at Midway Island, US President Nixon and South Vietnamese President Yu Yan Vien uh, announced 25,000 American troops would be withdrawn. You'll remember that Nixon just got elected last year and uh, got inaugurated. So they'll be coming out by the September. Um, June 10, my birthday, uh, further work of the manned orbiting laboratory uh, was halted on the orders of Nixon. Um, 23rd, the Soviet Union and 120 people were killed in the civilian airliner flew into the path of a faster moving uh, transport. 23rd of June, six bystanders on a busy Miami street were killed uh, when a Dominican Air Airlines flight crashed shortly after takeoff. 29th, the Malgram. This is interesting for those people who are interested in technology. The Malgram uh, was first tested in a joint venture between Western Union and the US Post Office. So I guess this is like a telegram, fax, whatever. Who remembers Malgrams? Yeah. Uh, in Australia, wasn't too much happening. 74 US men were killed when the destroyer, the Frank E. Evans, was accidentally rammed and sliced in two by an Australian uh, aircraft carrier. The subsequent investigation um, found that uh, 30, June 31st, the Melbourne had come within 50 feet of colliding with another American ship, the Larson. So I don't know what was going on out there. June 19. The Commonwealth Conciliation and Arbitration Commission rules that equal pay for women doing the same work as men must be phased out by 1972. How do we feel about that, ladies? Yeah, okay. Yeah, rock on, 72. <laughs> All right, very important. We have to find out what was happening with the Beatles in 1969. Um, and the penultimate day of their second bed-in for peace, John Lennon and Yoko Ono recorded the anthemic Give Peace a Chance in room 1742 in Montreal. Um, top 10, back in June of, uh, of, this, of 69, Get Back and Don't Let Me Down was the Beatles on top, Hair, The Real Thing, The Real Thing. Awesome, awesome. I think I've still got the single at home somewhere. Uh, um, 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 um. All right, so let's have a look at what was happening in the space world, Apollo in 69, June 69. Um, I'm going to have to whiz through these a little bit quickly because I'm not going to read every line of it. Basically, they approved the um, site selection for Apollo 12. Uh, they're going to go and try and land near one of the surveyors. June 9, uh, they're well on, uh, on schedule in, uh, for a July 16 launch date. Um, 
landing site mosaics were delivered to the flight crew training area. There was, um, June 3rd, the crews of Apollo 10 and 11 were set down for a debriefing. You see John Young there with his cigar. Uh, June the 3rd, the Apollo Program Change Control Board assigned Solar Wind Composite Experiment to the first moon landing. Early engineering evaluation of Apollo 10 launch vehicle indicated that major flight objectives were accomplished, but there were a few issues. Performance of the Saturn V was satisfactory, but they had some problems with uh, pump performance and a few other bits and pieces, and low frequency lateral vibration and oscillations. So that was stuff they had to work, work on. June 10, once again my birthday, the Apollo 11 crew had to walk around the Saturn V. Man, imagine that, eh? Gonna be jumping on that thing. Um, then the, later on they went up and had a poke around in the command module, make sure it was all good. Oops. I see Mike Collins got his enthusiastic thumb up there. He's happy with his, with his spacecraft. They all look pretty pleased to be going. Um, June the 11th, <coughs> Task Force for Hardware Development. Um, I'm going to whiz through this. Uh, 50 proposals for lunar orbital experiments. 13th, um, based on the excellent results of the Color TV, uh, of the Color TV on 10, they're going to they're going to uh, approve a plan to carry a Color TV on Apollo 11 in the command module. Um, you'll remember last year we had Neil um, bugging out of his um, lunar landing training vehicle. Well, he went back and made his first flight on June the 15th. That's quite a long time, isn't it? Uh, on on that. Um, Three days, he completed eight flights with the vehicle for a total of uh, 40 minutes and 14 seconds. Eight flights, so he made 14 takeoffs and landings. Um, now, I, th I thought you'd be interested just to have a quick look at a little bit of video of that because we sort of see pictures, but we don't really ever see much in the way of video. So I've got about five minutes of video. I just thought you'd be interested to have a look at this. This is Simon Bob. Way. Narrator. There's a fire engine. <coughs> Probably, yeah. I think it was Ellington Air Force Base near Houston, I think. I mean, the only video we normally see is when he's punching out of this thing, but this is actually, he's flying it, having a successful flight. But it's a pretty precarious device, you've got to admit, I tell you. It's like, wow. I bet you Neil was having the time of his life up there, though. So there's three of these built, and two of them crashed. There's one left, and it's hanging up on the roof in Houston, if everyone, anyone gets to Houston. The instrumentation. I'm sure he had altitude controls and things like that, but it would have been. I think the con controls were made to simulate the, the functions, but yeah. 
I mean, I think it was more about the dynamics of lateral and vertical movement and stuff like that. So basically, he's got a jet engine pointing vertically down, and he's by thrusting that he gets his up and down motion, etc. I mean, he's got the thrusters for lateral movement and that type of thing. Just in the interest of time, I might have to whiz through that a bit. Sorry about that. If I can. Any lane you can walk away on from is a good one, yeah? You get to move to the lane again, that's fantastic. <laughs> So then he had a bit of a chat to the press. Unfortunately, it's once again, it's silent. Okay, so getting back to uh, back to uh, Houston, uh, back to actually back to KC. Um, the base here at uh, Kennedy Space Center on the 16th of uh, June, they were doing this um, analog training um, at uh, Kennedy Space Center there. So you can see he's got this um, lanyard here, which is how he gets the camera down. Instructions by the ground crew. Neil with the camera. Buzz looks like he's deploying the solar wind experiment. In the simulator, 1G simulator, the controls of that. Here's Mike in the lunar module. Basically, if you've read anything about that, these uh, 1G simulators were basically side by side, so that each, each crew member would go to their station and they'd work together along with mission control and run through a whole mission or section to the mission. That's not a real hatch, by the way. So on the sit on the eighteenth, they went through um, all of the experience package and uh, basically the data plans for the procedures for the facilities. Twenty uh, third, preparation for the manned lunar landing continued, uh, and basically. Um, Countdown was uh, scheduled to begin on the 27th. Once again, doing more uh, equipment che uh, checks. I suspect that these might be the actual flight suits now, where they're getting closer to uh, to the mission. Uh, they need to get into those suits, make sure they fit and comfortable, and all work together. So, obviously, once they're out in space on the mission, they're not going to have all these technicians hanging around. So they have to help each other, work with each other, get the equipment working, see how it all works, etc. If you listen to the mission, Aldrin was excellent through the whole mission. Very, very supportive and professional. Um, so on the 15th, they reported uh, to headquarters and the summary indicated that they completed 70% of their tr briefing and reviews. I'll go, I won't read it all. Overall, 92% of the training program had been completed by the 27th of June, so they were well on their way. 27th, once again, um, decision was reached on who would be the first to step onto the moon, reported by the Apollo Spacecraft Program Office by George Lowe. Sometime during the middle of the night, I had a call from Associated Press informing me that there had been a story that Neil Armstrong had pulled rank on Buzz Aldrin to be the first man on the surface of the moon. They wanted to know whether it was true and how the decision was reached. To the best of my recollection, I gave the following information. A, there had been many informal plans developed during the past several years concerning the lunar timeline. These probably included all combinations of one man out versus two men out, who gets out first, etc. There was only one approved plan and that was established two to four weeks prior to the public announcement of this planning. I believe that was in April of 69. The basic decision was made by the Configuration Control Board and was based on recommendations by Flight Crew Operations Directorate. I'm sure that Armstrong had made an input to the recommendation, but he by no means had the final say. The CCB decision was final. And that's the official NASA history. All right, um, pre-launch EVA. I thought we've all seen pictures of them walking around with their spacesuits on the moon, fuzzy. Seen still pictures of them walking around training. I thought you'd be interested to see 
how these training goes uh, in with the actual suit. So this is silent once again, but just to get a concept and understanding of how cumbersome these suits are or were, and how much hard work it must have been doing that training in one G. And this is interesting. This is his a contingency sample collector. You see, it pops out of his pocket. He pulls a lanyard or a string, and it firms up and becomes a rod. And then uh, he go ahead and goes ahead and grabs a, a sample. But just have a look when they're walking around and moving and, and things. How how much hard work it would have been. This is the contingency sample. Basically, Neil was asked to take a sample pretty quickly once he got out there in case something went wrong and they had to scramble back in. They wouldn't want to get back to the earth without having at least a handful of dirt. So someone would have been rushed off to write some paperwork about why the thing fell off. But you can see how he had to kneel, kneel down and pick that up. It's not that easy. And watch this, how he, how, how he get in his pocket. the Herman Munster sort of walk. And it's interesting, in the ground train they've got CDR and LMP on the back of their backpacks, but when they got on the moon they never thought to, to identify them separately, so once they got on the, on the moon they knew, didn't know who was who. Later on they added a red stripe on the, on the legs and the sleeves of the commander just to identify them uh, between one and the other. But uh, you would have thought they would have done that on the ground. So there's that uh, lanyard we were talking about, the equipment transport lanyard. So basically the, the idea is that was actually clipped to Neil when he got out of the lunar module, going down the ladder, and then he would step back and Buzz would attach the camera and they'd bring it down um, to the surface for Neil. And they also used that lanyard to transport up the rock boxes back up to the, uh, to the lunar module itself. But uh, yeah, as I say, like just seeing them move around, it's... Uh, Quite, um, quite an, an operation. I mean, their suits were cool, but it would have been quite physically taxing, I reckon, doing that, because these training sessions went on for three or four hours, or a couple of hours at least. So once again, no viewfinder with these cameras. They just have to basically turn around and sort of point where you want to go and take the picture. So they did really well.
just trying to look down. Looks like he's trying to take a picture of a bit of the surface or something. Michael Collins up here trying to get into it. Sorry, Mike, you've got to stay in orbit. Come on. We told you three times already. So for those who are not familiar, this this is I think they call it the modular equipment carrier or something. Basically, that there is the TV camera. So when Neil came down, he pulled a lanyard and it deployed this carrier, and the camera was was mounted on top of that carrier, which was where we got the first steps. Later on, they detached it, flipped it upside down, put it on a tripod to watch the rest of the mission of the moonwalk. That sounds right, yeah, 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 Misa. But there was another one on the other side of the, of the uh, legs which carried some experiments. I'm not sure which was which. But you can sort of see how, how much hard, hard work it is for them moving around. Oh, the, the suit's putting in pressurised, yeah, because they've got the face plates closed, so they would have had sort of, well, fully operational backpacks. So obviously, it wouldn't have the um, same configurations as the, as the um, um, zero atmosphere, but would have had that cooling and cooling for the suit and oxygen flow and that type of thing. Uh, some training you'll see where they are connected up with hoses, which is when they would be doing other types of training and testing. But these look like they're fully self-contained. So now you can see the camera's been removed from the stowage area and put on top of the tripod. And Neil's going to take that off and put it out. And there we go. Thanks, Neil. And this is where Al Bean on Apollo 12 pointed at the sun and bent the uh, tube out. So we never got TV from Apollo 12. And there's the solar wind experiment that Buzz is deploying. Tina Stag, our Tasmania correspondent, has piped in. It's a modular equipment stowage assembly. Just a couple more minutes if people are interested to watch this. I just find it fascinating. <laughs> Space geek. Guilty. So for those of you online, this is where they actually filmed the moonwalk. This is how they faked it. Send your letters and cards in later. So there's uh, one of the rock boxes. Actually, interesting thing about the rock box, um, it was manufactured by, I can't remember the name, but the company that manufactured the original mock rock boxes have now released a set of luggage styled on it. <laughs> it's like 600 bucks for a suitcase, but gee, I'd like one. <laughs> there's so much stuff coming out for Apollo 11. It's crazy. 50.
Uh, we might have to move on because time is against us. Um, oh, they, they, there was one seg session where they did a full run through with all the top brass from NASA, Von Braun, everybody sitting there taking notes, watching, and that was when they finally got the approval. And you can see carrying the uh, one of the experiment package. It's Buzz taking off. There's a picture, famous picture of him on the moon, walking off into the distance to deploy that. With Neil taking the picture there. And I think this shows you the deploy. Oh, I didn't. That's no, I had to run out of time. Uh, this is an interesting little thing popped up. Uh, Mike Collins posted this on Facebook and Twitter on the 14th. Throwback to the crew, found this at the bottom of a box. I don't think it was ever used by NASA. So there's a famous set of portraits, one of which I think we showed before. This is one that was never used, and it's quite a nice picture. And I, I like it, the fact that uh, Neil's got his hand on Buzz's shoulder. Yeah. It's nice. And they've all got nice smiles on their face, too. That's good. All right, so now we have to come back to 2019. This is Richard, back in 69. Now, who can tell me who this is? Well, you can tell who the tattoo is, right? Any clues? This is Roger Stone, one of Donald Trump's key advisors up until he got thrown in jail, or I think he's at court now. Um, he's got this tattoo in the middle of his back. So there you go, 2019. Happy days. All right, so uh, thank you for this. So now we're getting into the, the point.